So, the period following the collapse of the Mauryan Empire is usually glossed over in Indian history, but it's a period of great prosperity in Indian Ocean trade. So, Odia merchants had been trading with Southeast Asia for quite some time now. They used to make their way along the coast till Thailand, from where their goods then went inland to either uh, Vietnam and Cambodia. Um, it was in this Mekong region of Vietnam and Cambodia that you have the first Indianized kingdom of Southeast Asia emerge, which was the kingdom of Funan. Now, the founding myth of this kingdom places a great amount of importance on matrilineal power inheritance and Naga iconography, which is present in the region across time. It was probably Kandinya, a Brahmin from the east coast of India who made his way there and married into a local Naga clan to claim uh, power. By the 2nd century BCE, sailors had figured out how to make their way across the ocean directly. This was done by travelling southwards towards Sri Lanka and then catching the monsoon winds from there across to Indonesia. The return journey was then made in March. The festival of Karthik Purnima, which is still celebrated in Odisha, marks the time when these journeys were undertaken. Um, you have cotton and metalware that's been found in uh, Southeast Asia that originated in India, and because of its geographical location, India also became the midpoint uh, for interactions between the Mediterranean world and the Southeast Asian world. Remnants of Indian civilization here are still found in the form of culture, language, and religion. So, most of South Indian history is dominated by conflicts between the Cholas, the Cheras, and the Pandyas, and these conflicts have been well recorded in Sangam literature from the times. Now, Sangam literature also makes repeated references to exchanges that took place with North India, again dispelling the myth of an ancient Dravidian past having occurred in a vacuum. So, you had some Tamil groups settling in Sri Lanka around the 4th century BCE, and they then came up with um, small Tamil kingdoms around there. Now, Anuradhapura was one of the most important of these kingdoms, and that was settled by Tamils in 177 BCE. They held on to this for a few decades until the Sinhala king Datta Gemenu came and um, took it over. Now, this event is used by modern Sinhalas to claim their historical rights over the island. Now, the reason this is problematic is because it wouldn't have likely been seen as a Sinhala-Tamil conflict at the time, because the Sinhalas in fact actually had a long-standing alliance with the Tamil Pandyas. And also, it wouldn't have likely been seen as a Hindu-Buddhist rivalry as well, because Sri Lankan Buddhism has always been influenced by Hinduism. Now, Anuradhapura would remain the capital of the island for most of the next millennia, and its history is dominated by clashes between the Maurya and the Lakmana clans. So, maritime trade in the Western Indian Ocean was actually doing very well at this time, with the western coast of India linked very closely with the Greco-Roman world. The uh, trade route began at the port of Alexandria, from where goods made their way to Bernice on the Red Sea, and from there they travelled down the Red Sea and along the Persian Gulf. Uh, and in doing so, they then stopped at places like Adulis and Socotra. Then, when they made their way to India, there were two popular ports where they would stop at. One was Bharuch, which is in modern-day Gujarat, and the other was Muzeris near modern-day Kochi. Muzeris later became a more famous port because sailors developed the technique to travel across the ocean instead of requiring to travel along the coast. Um, Roman, uh, Indo-Roman trade was especially booming at this time, and there's actually a lot of evidence to show that the Romans were spending far more than they could afford on Indian luxuries. So, in general, India was a conduit between the Western and the Eastern Indian Ocean, uh, but there's evidence uh, showing that around the 5th century AD, there was a small band of people who made their way from uh, Indonesia across the ocean to Madagascar, and there's evidence of full-fledged settlements in Madagascar uh, from these people around the 8th century AD. Now, these settlers were called the Wakwak, and they lived on this island undisturbed uh, all the way till um, uh, many, uh, many centuries later when Arabs and Africans began colonizing the area. Mainland Africa at this time was actually undergoing quite a few demographic changes. So, you had the Bantu tribes who were from Nigeria originally migrating out of their native lands and uh, migrating in two groups. One of the groups went southwards uh, towards um, the equator, and the other went eastwards towards Congo. And while doing so, they replaced most of the native populations in the area. By the 4th and 5th century AD, you have trade routes on both sides of the Indian Ocean that are well established. And at the center of these trade routes is the Gupta Empire, which rules over a large part of the subcontinent at this time. So, ports in both Bengal and Gujarat especially were very important um, for access to the subcontinent. And through, it's through these ports that you have a lot of um, diplomats, merchants, pilgrims and scholars come. Now, one of the most important scholars to have come to the subcontinent at this time was Fahien, 
who came and spent a lot of time in India studying ancient Buddhist texts. So he left the subcontinent via a maritime route, which involved first sailing down the Ganga to uh, Bengal, and um, then from Tamrulipti taking a boat down to Sri Lanka. From Sri Lanka, he said that there were very large ships that used to occupy, uh, that used to operate on the route uh, to China, which went via Southeast Asia. As mentioned earlier, South India, for most of its history, was dominated by the conflicts between the Cheras, the Cholas, and the Pandyas. Though for a brief period, you see the rise of the Pallavas as a very strong kingdom as well. Now the Pallavas are a people whose origin is debated, but Sanyal finds evidence to suggest that they might have gained their royal legitimacy through marriage into the Naga clan. In the sixth century, under the rule of a king called Simha Vishnu, they came to conquer a large amount of neighboring areas, and at the height of uh, at the height of their power, would have controlled Tamil Nadu as well as parts of Andhra, Karnataka, and Sri Lanka. Um, Sam- Simha Vishnu's younger brother Bhima is said to have uh, sailed across the seas to a faraway land and established his own empire. Um, and uh, from there, you see uh, Nandi Varman, the prince from the story in the first chapter, return to reclaim the Pallava throne many generations later. The Pallavas were people who were actively engaged with Southeast Asia, but who were they engaging with over here? Now, at this point in Southeast Asia. You have uh, the Sri Vijaya Empire controlling large parts of uh, the Malay Peninsula and Sumatra. Then you have Java emerging as an important political center, and the kingdoms here would later evolve into the Majapahit Empire. The Khmers controlled a large part of Cambodia, and the Kingdom of Champa controlled large parts of Vietnam. Um, the Pallavas held considerable sway in the region at this point, so much so that some parts even started using the Pallava version of the Brahmi script um, as their own. You also had trade networks so well established that you find Indian merchants settling in Chinese ports, um, making their own uh, small communities, and even con- constructing temples over here. On the western side of the ocean, what you see at this time is Arabia on the eve of Islam. Now, ancient Yemen used to be the site of conflict between the Hadramis, the Sabians, and the Himyars. But uh, things changed after the second century AD when you had uh, first Jews and then Arabs migrating into the region. Because of this, Yemenis moved into Oman, but they were also dealing with their own set of Arab migrations. The Sasanian Empire from Persia and then the Byzantine Empire also got in on the act, but the Byzantines started converting people to Christianity also. Now, things changed quite fast with the rise of Islam. So, the first Muslims took over Mecca and its surrounding areas, and then appealed to others for support in, uh, in their cause. Now, the Yemenis and Omanis agreed, um, to rid themselves of Persian rule, and also in the process agreed to convert to Islam. So, uh, following the death of Muhammad, Islam spread rapidly throughout the region, first taking over all of the Persian Empire and parts of the Byzantine Empire, and then also later going into Egypt, Jerusalem, Syria, and Palestine. Now, there was a split in the re- religion soon after, which caused the Shia-Sunni divide, which also then caused numerous wars in the years to come. And interestingly, you find stories of Indian mercenaries fight- fighting on the sides of Shias. So, despite the geopolitical disruptions that were going on in the Middle East, trade between India and the Middle East continued quite well. A large number of Muslims began settling in India, and especially in Kerala, you had the uh, establishment of a transitory male trader population who took local wives, which resulted in the development of matrilineal customs there, which survived till today. The Abbasids also established a strong um, Islamic empire and moved their capital from Damascus to Baghdad which then further bolstered Indian Ocean trade. So, by the 8th century, you have Arabs moving overland into the subcontinent, defeating Raja Dhir Singh of Sindh in their first conquest. Now, despite this first victory, they weren't able to make significant inroads into the subcontinent, so they decided to move towards Central Asia instead. Central Asia at the time was occupied largely by Zoroastrians and Buddhists. So, the Zoroastrians on the attack of the Arabs decided to flee and settle in the subcontinent, becoming the Parsi community. So, while you had Parsis, Arabs and Jews that were settling in the subcontinent, um, you had one population that was also moving outwards. And so these were the itinerant communities from across India, who migrated towards Europe and uh, then became what we now call the Gypsies.